I, I want to welcome you all to this uh, conference uh, and just say quickly a, a few words about it. The uh, conference was motivated by uh, an idea that um, when you look at climate change, the uncertainties are so uh, profound and, and uh, so many that uh, conventional tools for uh, modeling uncertainty and factoring uncertainty into the analysis might not be adequate. Um, I've worked uh, a lot in recent years with funding from the state of California on uh, impacts. Much of the existing literature, not all, but much of the existing literature on climate change doesn't allow for risk aversion. Um, uh, and for certain impacts in certain areas, well, obviously for uh, you know, melting of the ice sheets and whatever, there's some awareness of uh, the need to do something about that. But there are many other impacts which are local, but for the people who are affected in that locality, they may have a, a risk aversion and they may have a willingness to pay uh, to avoid those risks which would be relevant in a damage assessment. But the, the larger issue is we don't have a handle on probabilities and how to think about the uh, probabilities. And um, so the question was, can some of the conceptual tools being developed by theorists on uh, uh, decision making under ambiguity and concepts of ambiguity, uh, would they be applicable in, uh, in the context of climate change? And in that context, uh, there's really many levels. There's the sort of very large scale level of uh, an integrated assessment model like DICE or, or other models where the question is um, uh, overall levels of emission control. But uh, when you get to impacts and adaptation, there are going to be lots of low level uh, decisions. Is it worth building a, a reservoir or is it worth building a seawall or is it worth uh, investing in desalination or, or investing in some new type of crop or whatever? So, uh, and, and there'll be the same sort of uh, challenge of uh, profound uncertainty and not knowing how to sort of express the uncertainty and factor it into the decision. So I, I see these questions as having application at uh, many levels from the sort of global mitigation to uh, local uh, uh, investments. And so the idea of the conference was to bring together researchers who have developed and uh, been applying concepts of ambiguity together with the uh, uh, climate modelers and uh, other economists like myself who have been working on uh, um, uh, modeling impacts and, and looking into adaptation. This, uh, these two days are meant to be a conversation. So uh, uh, the idea is there'll be a speaker uh, or two uh, up here, but f for the most part, this is a conversation around the table. And this is intended really for everybody's mutual uh, benefit uh, with the hope that uh, uh, we uh, learn things from one another and develop ideas for um, uh, uh, future work. Uh, the meetings will be held here. Uh, uh, lunch will be held here. There'll be a reception tonight and sort of uh, uh, food for dinner in, in the courtyard. So um, this is the venue. Uh, I want to thank the NSF, which provide the core funding, and the Giannini Foundation, uh, uh, which supports my department, Agricultural and Resource Economics, and uh, LBNL and Bill Collins for the funding that made this possible. Rashida has been uh, the uh, soul of uh, the effort, and so she's made this uh, possible. What I thought uh, we'd do is just go around the table and, and introduce yourself and, and say your name and where you're from and just uh, what is your field. And once we've finished that, uh, we'll um, uh, have the first session. And I should mention my uh, colleague, uh, Christian Traeger, uh, in uh, the Agriculture and Resource Economics Department, who uh, has uh, worked very hard uh, on the program and with talking to you and inviting you. So Christian and I are the uh, co-conspirators in uh, dragging you here, and we hope you have a nice time. Christian, just... Uh... Yeah, my name is Christian Traeger. Thanks for the... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't been in that room either yet. My name is Christian Traeger. I'm an assistant professor here at the same department for Agriculture and Resource Economics in Berkeley, and my interests are in climate change and in decision theory in 
particularly in uncertainty, and if we look at climate change or other environmental problems, it's very frequent that we actually don't know the uh, probabilities. And that's uh, how I got into the, or my interest developed into ambiguity, um, and particularly in the context of environmental resource economics. Um, David. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Budescu. I'm a professor of psychology at Fordham University. I'm doing work on human judgment and decision making with incomplete and imprecise information. I'm Rob Lempert, a senior scientist at RAND, and I've been working in uh, developing and then applying and evaluating tools for decision making under deep uncertainty, we call it, and we've been doing a lot of work actually with, with David and then Klaus in uh, developing and applying these tools in, for water management in the West and a variety of other climate change applications. I'm John Hart. I'm a faculty member here at Berkeley in the Energy and Resources Group. My research focuses on the ecological impacts of climate change and ecological feedbacks to climate change. My name is Rick Vanderplug. I'm of the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm co-director of a, a center of uh, economics of resource-rich economies. Uh, and I have a a side interest in climate change, so I'm coming mainly to learn. And uh, thank you very much for that opportunity. My name is Klaus Keller. I'm a geoscientist. I'm a faculty at Penn State. I work mostly on climate thresholds. Um, majority of my work is in the scientific analysis, what are uncertainties, and once in a while I um, dabble in economics. I'm Hossein Farzin, a faculty from uh, UC Davis in Agricultural and Resource Economics. My current research is mainly related to sustainability, intergenerational equity, and discount rate. My name is Jadwiga Tsiolkowska. I'm assistant professor at the Humboldt University of Berlin. I'm a visiting scholar here at Berkeley at ARI, and my research is focused on biofuels policy with regard to environmental aspects and decision-making support. My name is Sanya Gertikova. I'm assistant professor at Cornell, and uh, my research is uh, on decision-making and uncertainty and case-based decision theory, and I'm trying to connect the case-based decision theory to ambiguity. My name is Andreas Lange, I'm at the University of Maryland. My research focuses in particular on environmental economics, some climate policy, but also on experimental and behavioral economics, and that basically links the decision and uncertainty, um, first in a decision context, but then also really how do people actually behave to test this in some experiments. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Larry Dale, I work at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory close by here. My interests are um, resource economics, water uh, and energy economics, and I'm interested in how um, the science of climate change and the <coughs> economics of climate change interact. <coughs> My name is Ian Mitroff. I'm in a uh, research center here at Berkeley which studies uh, large-scale catastrophes, and my work is at the intersection of uh, psychoanalysis and large-scale crises. My name is Larry Karp. I'm in ag, ag and Resource Economics. I'm interested in climate policy, including uh, the application of hyperbolic discounting and uh, using game theory to study the formation of international environmental agreements. My name is Steve Sane. I'm a statistician with the Institute for Mathematics Applied to the Geosciences at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, right now, much of my research involves uh, developing method statistical methodology to analyze um, ensembles of climate model output, in particular regional climate models, uh, as well as trying to connect climate and climate change to uh, public health endpoints. I'm George Judge uh, from UC Berkeley. My area is uh, econometrics and information theoretic methods. Uh, I'm Dan Farber, uh, also from UC Berkeley. Um, I'm at the law school, but also the chair of the Energy and Resources Group, uh, which is uh, broadly multidisciplinary. Um, my interest uh, uh, is in how government agencies 
uh, do and also should make decisions under uncertainty or ambiguity. Um, thanks. Yes. It's a bit of a reach. Um, I'm Bill Collins. I'm on the faculty with the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department here at Berkeley and also at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. I work on the physics of climate change and on simulating climate change, but I'm intensely interested in trying to connect that work with practical policy formation. I am Fulvio Fontini from the University of Padova in Italy. I'm interested in application of Choke expected utility and also in um, uh, ren renewable energy sources and decision making on energy economics related with climate change. My name is uh, Marcello Basili. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Siena. Uh, my research is on decision making and uh, ambiguity, and particularly on application of precautionary principle uh, in the case of infectious disease or environmental economics. I am uh, Min Hadiong. I'm a researcher at the CNRS in France, and I work in integrated assessment of climate change and uncertainty. My name is Matthias Schmidt. I'm doing my PhD at the Boston Institute in Germany on uh, climate policy under uncertainty and learning about uncertainty with a focus on the energy sector. Yeah. I'm John Quiggin from the University of Queensland in Australia. I mostly work on economics of uncertainty and recently have been interested in applications of that to climate change, interaction between uncertainty and discounting and the unknown unknowns problem. I'm Ralph Winkler from the University of Bern. With respect to climate change, my research interests are mainly in the fields of intergenerational equity and discounting and the formation of international environmental agreements. Uh, I'm Bob Anderson from the Economics Department at Berkeley, and my interest is in general equilibrium theory. I'm Paolo Girardato uh, from the University of Torino. Um, my research area is decision theory, in particular decision making under ambiguity and bounded rationality, limited foresight, and things like that. I'm Sujoy Mukherjee. I'm from University of Oxford. Um, I'm an economist. I work on uh, decision making under uncertainty, foundations, applications. Good morning, my name is Guido Franco. I'm with the California Energy Commission. I am a research manager. My area of interest is on regional climate change science, in particular, anything that has to deal with California. There are um, uh, several people, including Claudia Tibaldi and Jeff Heal, who will be with us tomorrow but couldn't be here today. And also, uh, two people who, in the last minute, couldn't come, uh, Ken Arrow and Martin Schneider from, from Stanford. Um, and um, there are about a dozen people who wanted to come but couldn't because they have a conference somewhere else on climate change uh, today. And, and just so uh, you know as a statistic, it turns out there are at least four conferences on climate change in other parts of the world today. There's a committee from Working Group 3 meeting in Tokyo. There's a committee associated with Working Group 2 meeting in Geneva. There's a National Research Council committee in DC, and there's a conference in North Carolina. And so uh, since this week and this day was sort of chosen at random, you could form an approximate estimate of the number of meetings being held around the world. So with that, we'll uh, start with the uh, first session with um, John and Klaus. Uh, so it's in your hands. I want to apologize in advance. I have to run and teach a course from 12.30 to 2. And so I will miss a little bit of the last part of session two and a little bit of the first part of session three. What I've shown on the screen is what you might call the, the central prediction of current climate models with respect to what will happen to Earth's average surface temperature if the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere doubles. Or to be more precise, if the effective concentration of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere doubles. There are two parts to the central prediction. One is what's called the direct effect of the greenhouse gases on surface temperature, a result of the fact that these gases trap heat and radiate 
heat down to the surface of the Earth from the atmosphere. And that's about 1.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, there's not much uncertainty in that number. The big uncertainty in the current predictions comes from a range of estimates of what are called the feedback effects or indirect contributions to global warming. And three major feedback effects are captured in the typical general circulation model output that we've been getting over the last several decades. Uh, first of all, heating from this direct effect will cause some melting of ice and snow and change the surface reflection properties of Earth. Ice will melt, particularly in the polar regions and at high elevations. The Earth will become browner, less white. It will absorb more solar energy. And so there's a positive feedback effect. A second feedback comes about because warmer air can hold more water vapor, and water vapor is an important greenhouse gas. And a third feedback effect is that as the atmospheric uh, temperature changes and as uh, evaporation and transpiration of water from the surface changes, cloud characteristics will change. There can be either denser clouds, thinner clouds, higher clouds, lower clouds, and the effect of all of these um, uh, effects is to change temperature and the range of estimated contribution from these indirect feedback effects is between roughly one and a half and four and a half, 4.6 degrees Celsius. Um, the, if you take an average over different climate models and you ask the climate modelers, what's your best estimate? People are converging around numbers like three degrees Celsius. And what I want to argue today is that the actual uncertainty in our projections of what climate will look like 50 years from now, let's say, is much greater than this. Um, first of all, uh, there are processes that have occurred over paleoclimate time periods, over the last several hundred thousand years, which clearly indicate that there are feedback mechanisms at work in the Earth system which are not, probably not, captured in our current models. And one example of a phenomenon that speaks feedback to us is the famous Vostok ice core data. If we go back, and this only takes us back 160,000 years, but we can run this back about 800,000 years we see that when temperatures were high in interglacial periods in the past, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were high. And when temperatures were cold during glacial periods, carbon dioxide levels were low. Now, we know that the direct forcing that has caused this cycle of ice age and, and interglacial period is due to something called Milankovitch forcing. It's the subtle changes in the geometry of Earth's orbit and of Earth's spin axis, which affect how much solar radiation we receive on Earth, which affects the climate. That's the direct forcing, kind of the equivalent, if you like, of the CO2's direct effect from anthropogenic emissions. But those Milankovitch mechanisms are way too weak to explain the temperature excursions that we see between glacial and interglacial periods. So how do we account for the huge temperature differences between glacial and interglacial periods? Well, a good part of the answer is right there on the board. It's the carbon dioxide. But where did the carbon dioxide come from? It wasn't the case that by coincidence, volcanoes or um, uh, wildfire was simultaneously producing carbon dioxide just to match the Milankovitch cycle. The current best understanding of this correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature, and we could draw the same graph for methane and temperature, by the way, is that small amounts of temperature forcing from Milankovitch cause small amounts of carbon dioxide to escape from either the oceans or the forests or the soils on Earth and go to the atmosphere where they cause more warming, which causes more carbon release. And this continues to build up 
greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere until the Milankovitch mechanism says, oops, time to start cooling as the geometry of our orbit changes. And then the feedbacks work in reverse. There's still positive feedback. They amplify, but now they drive us cooler and cooler. And the interesting thing is that we don't really know in any kind of quantitative detail where this carbon dioxide and methane are coming from. We suspect that coming from two lar either or both of two large carbon sources on Earth, soils, which hold about five times as much carbon today as the atmosphere holds in the form of CO2, or oceans, which hold about 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere. But just what mechanisms are at work driving that carbon out of the oceans or the soils into the atmosphere as the Earth starts to warm is not understood. And in, by and large, with a few exceptions with recent models, it's not captured in the um, central IPCC predictions. So we don't capture it because we don't understand it, but that feedback was there in the past and it may be there in the future. Now, can we quantify feedback? It, yes, there's actually, we go way back to the early electric engineering literature and there's a, a nice worked out theory of how to quantify feedback. You have an input signal, there's a feedback loop which is, has a strength which I denote by the feedback factor F. And as you go round and round the feedback loop, you get a sum of amplifications or diminishments of the input signal, depending on whether the feedback is positive or negative. And the formula that results, I don't know if I have a pointer, but is, is there something? No, okay. Uh, this describes, in a nutshell, how feedback operates. Um, when you sum an infinite number of loops uh, uh, of feedback. And the interesting thing is this feedback factor can be calculated if you know the mechanisms that are causing the feedback. You can calculate it through a partial derivative chain rule and it works out that you can actually come up with reasonable back of the envelope estimates of things like the ice albedo feedback or the water vapor feedback using this kind of very simple approach. In the general circulation models, this is all handled much more sophisticatedly, but I want to show you sort of how a, a simple-minded modeler like me would think about this problem. Now, Margaret Torn and I took the Vostok data and used that simple formula for the feedback factor and estimated the strength of F from the Vostok data. And what we came up with was an increase in F from both the methane and the CO2 feedbacks that the Vostok data tell us likely exist. And we came up with an F of about 0.08. Now, that leads to an increase in the, um, in, at the upper limit of 4.6, that little change in F drives the upper limit of warming up to 6.3. At the lower limit, it doesn't have much effect. It only changes 1.5 to 1.65. Now, why is it so asymmetric? Well, this graph shows the origin of the asymmetry in how the uncertainty in F propagates to effect on temperature. What I've plotted here is very simply the function 1.2 degrees Celsius, which is the forcing from doubled CO2, divided by that feedback factor 1 minus F. And the property of 1 minus F that's of interest is that as F gets big, as it approaches 1, this becomes ultimately infinite at F equals 1. Now, where our current models say if you just look at ice albedo, water vapor, clouds, we're around 0.6 or 0.7. Let's say point, I've plotted this for 0.7. Uh, 0.65 is probably a better estimate. And here is where a model would stand today if it says F is 0.7, and we get a temperature increase of about three degrees for that value of F. But now as we add additional feedbacks, we very rapidly increase the temperature response because of this simple nasty property of the function 1 over 1 minus f. Now, let's look at the biosphere and ask, could ecological responses to climate change give us some additional f 
in addition to what's already in the models. And one source might be carbon. So let's look just one example of evidence that carbon feedback could be huge from ecological processes. And I'm only going to look at some data from soil and ask what would happen if, um, for example, ecosystem respiration, which is the total rate at which plants and, and organic matter uh, produce carbon dioxide through respiration, the decomposition of organic matter in soil, or plant respiration of its photosynthetically produced materials to, to um, essentially to carry out its metabolic needs. If you increase respiration relative to photosynthesis globally by 5%, I've circled the, I don't know why I'm not seeing this. Um, oh, there, okay. Uh, by 5%, that turns out each year to result in a net flow to the atmosphere of 5% of 75 gigatons of carbon per year, because that's the rate of respiration today on Earth. And that equals 3.75 gigatons of carbon per year. Interestingly, that's roughly, it's actually a little bigger than the amount by which the atmosphere is increasing its carbon dioxide each year just from human activities, from fossil fuel burning. So a 5% effect. A 5% difference between respiration and photosynthesis would double the effective rate of in increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, what do the data say about the response of respiration to temperature? Here are some data, and if you showing on the vertical axis, soil respiration rate on the x-axis, temperature. And it turns out from that graph that a 50% rise in soil respiration will result from a 5 degree rise in soil temperature. So take a 5 degree rise in surface temperature, which is in the range of current models, you get a 50% increase in soil respiration. And that is, you got a better, okay. And, and we're talking now 50%, just a mere 5%. Now I don't, claim that these numbers are going to actually describe what's going to happen. We just don't know. But the point is that there's a potential for huge feedback from natural ecological carbon cycles being disrupted by climate change. Now, at some point, this has to quench because you can run out of easily decomposable soil organic matter, and then the response will shrink. But at least for some number of years, we could be seeing huge losses of soil carbon um, as a result of temperature increase. A major caveat that expresses our uncertainty about these kinds of ecological responses is that temperature isn't the whole story. Soil moisture matters also. Let's look at albedo. What I've shown here are estimates ranging from the rainforest near the equator to the tundra near the poles of the surface albedo which results from the vegetation type that exists in that biome community. So we're talking terrestrial albedo. And we see that as we go from one biome to another, there are huge differences in adjacent albedos. Now, I've shown with an arrow a very rough estimate of the shift in the biome type that would result if you adopt a simple climate envelope uh, assumption, which says that plant communities will become whatever their climate conditions dictate they should be, and we know what climate conditions uh, lead to what types of vegetation communities from existing data. So as the climate warms, the vegetation communities shift forward. And so very naively, you might expect savanna to become desert. or um, uh, grassland to become temperate deciduous forest, or uh, boreal forest to become taiga um, or tundra. These shifts as that could occur over, not quickly, but over maybe a, a century or more, would result in some complicated combination of albedo changes over the different latitudes. And albedo changes of this magnitude the differences between adjacent biomes can have a huge effect. 
Suppose an initial five degree global warming resulted in a total albedo shift of just minus 0.05. We're talking here about differences from 0.05 up to 0.35. So a 0.05 shift in surface albedo on the land is plausible. And if it were to occur, delta F would increase by 0.05. And adding that to the CO2 and the methane feedbacks, we now get an upper limit of temperature of 8.6. Again, I'm not predicting this will happen. I'm simply trying to convince you that ecosystems are big players in the climate system, and the potential is there for shifts in ecosystems to have a big effect. Now, we took a model called IBIS, which is a coupled climate ecosystem model, and ran it uh, through different scenarios about how fast and how effectively vegetation communities could respond to climate change. Will, for example, boreal forest march northward into the tundra as the planet warms up? The conditions for climate-wise would be fine, but other things have to happen. In particular, the plants have to disperse through the movement of seeds to their new climate conditions. And so we took a set of different scenarios about dispersal capability of plants. The reason we used a scenario approach is ecologists don't know how rapidly plant communities can move to new locations. It's very uncertain. And the interesting thing is that these different scenarios lead to different feedback factors for albedo, for soil carbon, and the differences from one scenario to another are big. They amount to an albedo, uh, a feedback uh, difference of about 0.05. And so again, as you get near that F equals 1 value, a difference in F of 0.05 can have a huge amplifying effect. Um, the difference in the carbon scenarios is the difference of magnitude hundreds of gigatons of carbon either added to the atmosphere or removed from the atmosphere as a result of this. So the effects are potentially huge. And just to show you what current models um, can tell us about, say, the carbon cycle, um, what we see across a range of, of current models. This was a review paper that was published in Nature in 2008, is that up until around 1950 or 60, the models all seem to sort of say the same thing. But as the planet warms, the uncertainties grow, and we get shifts in, in the total amount of terrestrial carbon uptake in the biosphere that vary by huge amounts. The units here are gigatons per year. So it's a, it's a big effect. Um, just a sample of uh, some of the other biophysical responses. Um, we're going to see probably an increased frequency and intensity of wildfire as the planet warms. That, will, that has the capability of releasing huge quantities of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, quantities that are in the ballpark of anthropogenic effects, uh, if you look at sort of worst case fire models for the future. Melting of permafrost in, an arc in the Arctic and warming of soils globally will release carbon dioxide and methane. We've talked about that. Warming of deep ocean water and altered ocean circulation creates the potential for the release of deep high pressure methane clathrates to the atmosphere, causing additional large warming. These signs, by the way, are the sign of the feedback. A pus feedback means that it's going to enhance the warming. A negative feedback means it will counter the warming. The albedo effect due to altered vegetation communities could be positive or negative. It's probably going to be positive in the Arctic. That is, as boreal forest expands, the Arctic will be darker. It will absorb more sunlight, and we'll see additional warming. But there are other places where the albedo feedback could lead to some cooling. Uh, and then warming of ocean water over long time frames has the potential to release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, because warmer seawater can hold less carbon dioxide due to the chemistry of CO2 equilibrium between water and air. So those are some of the potentials. The situation gets worse when we start to think about the interaction between global warming, which is only one of many anthropogenic stresses 
on the Earth's system with, say, for example, ozone uh, hole, acid rain, deforestation. And what I've drawn here, and I don't have time to go into these and explain why, but I've asked the question whether global warming interacts synergistically in such a way as to enhance the warming effect when it combines with deforestation. And same with each pair between these. And what you see is the combination of two of these stresses tends to act in a positive synergistic way to make the sum of the effects um, less than the combined effect of the two acting together. The whole is worse than the sum of the parts. There are a few minus signs here, but generally what we get are, um, are um, destructive synergistic combinations of impacts. Um, here, here, just to wind up, so I want to summarize what, in my view, are some of the major points of controversy, the major issues at the science policy interface. Uh, one, and, and I'm telling you this from the perspective of an ecologist, a scientist, not an economist. Uh, one question is, how do we set policy under the huge asymmetric uncertainty that was implicit in that picture I showed you with the 1 over 1 minus f? It leads to what are called fat-tailed probability distributions. So the next slide will show you an example. And it raises very, very severe policy issues. Um, what constitutes a sensible target for energy policy? Should our target be to keep the CO2 level below some amount? Should it be to keep the temperature below some amount? Both of those are difficult targets to put in practice because we don't know what the future CO2 level will be because we don't understand the feedbacks. And since the temperatures are so sensitive to the feedbacks, we really don't know how to predict and say, uh, you know, a two degree warming is acceptable and that should be our target. We can say a two degree warming may be the maximum that's acceptable, but it's not an implementable target for policy because we don't know what amounts of emissions will keep us under two degrees because we can control what we emit, perhaps, if we get our politics in order, but we can't control the feedbacks that those emissions trigger. So um, in my view, the only thing we can really re um, set as targets is emission rates, but I know that's a controversial issue. Another issue is our currently observed extreme events caused by global warming the huge increase in wildfires, California, um, out, droughts and other, other in, interesting phenomena like Katrina, to what extent can we say those are caused by global warming? It's a scientific issue of, uh, which people are working on at, great, at a great pace. There's a lot of new interesting and constructive work in that area, but as far as being able to say to policymakers, you know, Katrina was the, um, half of Katrina was due to global warming. We're not there. Um, and then related to this, are there really tipping points? An issue that gets a lot of prominence. Um, and if there are, which I'm convinced actually there very well could be, can we know where they are in advance? And that I think is a much more difficult problem for policy. I'm not convinced we can know where they are in advance until they smack up, hit us in the face. And lastly, can we adapt? How do we adapt to such an uncertain moving target? It's hard enough to adapt to a big planetary stress when we can characterize it accurately. But what if it's as uncertain as climate warming seems to be? And can we geoengineer? And of course, every geoengineering scheme will trigger feedbacks just like warming will, and if we don't understand the feedbacks from uh, carbon dioxide emissions, how are we gonna understand the feedbacks from putting smoke and mirrors up in the atmosphere? Um, Fat-tailed impact distributions, I just wanna say a quick word about it. Um, the, um, here, here's our old formula, the temperature increase is the direct effect divided by one minus F. Suppose you had a probability distribution for F, call it Q of F, probability density. Uh, then you can work out what the probability density for delta T is, for the temperature effect. You really care about this, not about F, 
but you can use the Jacobian and get that the temperature dis uh, probability distribution will be the F distribution evaluated as F is a function of delta temperature, and that goes like 1 minus delta T naught, the forcing divided by the temperature change. And then there's this factor out in front of 1 over the temperature change squared. And the problem is that, and this is the issue of fat tails, that if Q is nearly any commonly used distribution, and F is assumed to range from, let's say, minus infinity to 1, then delta T can range from 0 to infinity. And when you look at this for almost any reasonable distribution for Q of F, you find that there are singularities and that the moments of the temperature increase don't exist. The mean becomes infinite. The variance doesn't, is, is infinite. And um, we can't really even speak about the mean cost of global warming. And this is Marty Weitzman's point, who unfortunately couldn't be here. But I think it's a very, very important issue. Just in a nutshell, I've got a, two graphs to finish with. Um, the climate challenge has been characterized by Rob Sokolow and Steve Pakala in terms of this idea of wedges. And here we are today, current emissions. This is gigatons of carbon per year, years. And we're here, let's call it seven. It's a little bigger now, actually. And in the future, under business as usual, we're going to see emissions increase. And if we want to stabilize emissions, we would, of course, have to fill in these wedges with new technologies, increased efficiency of energy use, and so on. These are the Sokolo wedges. Uh, if we're going to do better than stabilize emissions, which of course will not stabilize climate, we have to get emissions down below some value. And we don't know what that value will be because we don't know what the future carbon sinks are going to look like. But let's say we knew we had to get it down to about two gigatons per year. Then we'd have to find these additional wedges of new technology, solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear, efficiency, whatever, and achieve this. And what I'm arguing here is that the problem is much worse than this because there are destabilization wedges. These are a different kind of wedge. These are feedbacks. Here's the methane feedback, maybe, the carbon feedback, albedo, and so forth. And these are the uncertain wedges. And so we have much more to do than find the technologies for these wedges. If we, how much of this will occur depends on how much of this we fill in. As we find these wedges, these start to shrink because these are driven by the warming that occurs if we don't find those wedges. So we've got a very big problem on our hands, and that is meant to illustrate it. The main points of this talk are paleo data, modern observations, and I didn't talk about them, but ecosystem manipulation experiments, which is what I do for a living, and models all suggest that ecosystems respond to climate changes in ways that generate large feedbacks not currently included in our climate models. Many of these missing feedbacks appear to be positive. The warming feeds the warming. They induce very asymmetric, fat-tailed uncertainties into predictions. And in Earth system science, sadly, there are fundamental knowledge gaps, like knowing how fast vegetation communities can disperse to new locations, that impede our ability to quantify ecological feedbacks to climate change. And off the record, this is where I've come to in my work, reliably predicting future climate-induced food supply shortfalls, predicting disease outbreaks, coastline inundation, storm damage, intensification of wildfires is possibly more difficult, more difficult to achieve those reliable predictions than it would be to plan for and implement a low-carbon future. Thanks. Uh, John referred to uh, changes in the uh, uh, average uh, global temperature. And um, it's important to recognize that that itself can be misleading. I'll give you some numbers. 
um, a two degree change in global average annual temperature, uh, uh, this is according to the Hadley model, corresponds to 3.3 degrees change in uh, uh, average annual temperature in California and much of the West. Um, and that's because there's less warming near the um, equator and more in northern latitudes, and there's less warming uh, on the ocean and more on land. So the number for California is 3.3. But that's year-round. Uh, and in the winter, there's less warming, and in the summer, there's more warming. So the winter number for California, the average uh, three, uh, warming in three months of winter is 2.3 degrees. The average warming in June, July, August in California is 4.6. So global two degrees is 4.6. Now that's the statewide average. Uh, if you looked at Southern California and the Central Valley, uh, from uh, Fresno to Sacramento, which is the main farming area, that gets closer to five degrees in the summer. Uh, so two degrees global change in temperature is nearly five degrees centigrade where most of the population lives and where most of the agriculture is produced. Um, and uh, um, if you look, uh, we've done the same thing for uh, another scenario. Global is 4.1 degrees. This is the A1FI Hadley. Um, Southern California and uh, the Central Valley are close to 10 degrees. So it, it uh, changes the complexion, particularly on the impact side, when you get away from uh, the global numbers and start looking at numbers in areas where people live. But Klaus. Thank you. Um, OK. Um, Michael asked me to give an overview about uncertainties and ambiguities and how this relates to decision making, but to stay away from economic analysis, which is a very wise uh, point. For, for now. For, for now, <laughs> no worries, mate. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I will try to uh, deliver that. If I fall asleep, just kick me, because in Sydney it's, I think, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still a little bit asleep here. Um, what I would like to start with is to link this to the one key word in the conference title, ambiguity. Uh, and I have to admit, um, I have learned what this means only rather recently, working with Dave Badescu and Rob Lampert. Uh, so for me, one key figure that shows the ambiguity is to go just straight to the IPCC and look at the PDF, the Polydensity Function of Climate Sensitivity, as it is communicated to the decision makers. And what you see here is that the modes are between 1.2 and 4, and there are several modes here, and those are from different models, different estimates. So uh, even if you were to look, just give me your best range, you don't know which PDF to get, which is a key sign of ambiguity. Now, let me start out with asking two simple questions. What can cause such ambiguity, and can we have some way to reduce this ambiguity? And so um, one example now moving to work that we have done is to say, what are key sources for uncertainty? And recognizing that in the IPCC here, uh, this is a rather democratic club. Uh, everybody's model has the same value, even the ones that make not as much sense with given the data than the others. But of course, once you write papers, you can um, abandon this assumption. Uh, and so what we've done here is a very simple case. We take an, a simple carbon cycle climate model. We do an Bayesian assimilation. And we estimate the PDF of climate sensitivity. And so what we get is, uh, at some point, you have to make decisions. One decision, for example, is what are estimates of past androgenic uh, sulfur dioxide emissions? And you know, you talk to Steve Smith, or you talk to Elmer Kriegler, or to other people, and you have different experts who say, let's have expert A versus expert B. It turns out that your PDF, and I will not name any names here, but your expert A and expert B are vastly different. So the blue dotted line is one expert. The green line is the second expert. And you can say, well, let's just plot them next to each other. But then, of course, uh, your postdoc, who is a smart guy, says, well, but do they make sense given the data? You say, well, you're actually in luck. Because what happens is that a time series of forcing results in a time series of a temperature response. And then you can do simple Bayesian model averaging, where you say, well, let's be democratic, uh, principle of insufficient reason, and give them equal priors, but then let the data speak which estimate makes more sense. And then you do a Bayesian model averaging of both experts, and you arrive at the red curve, 
which reduces the uncertainty and, by the way, gives maybe 80, 90 percent of the way to one expert less to the other, which gives you maybe some confidence that you could uh, reduce some of this ambiguity. Note that this still leaves the effect upper tail, uh, which we have discussed before, and we will return to this in the discussion later on. Um, and so there's some hope, but of course there are many, many other sources. This is just a proof of concept study. But what I would like to talk about now is so what? Um, and this is the climate sensitivity. Um, it's an interesting historical artifact, I think, introduced by Svante Arrhenius, 1897, as a thought experiment, which you can do by pencil and paper, reading a very arduous work. And what happened is that uh, he said, let's keep it simple. Uh, what happens if we double the CO2 concentration, wait for infinite time, and let the system equilibrate? That's not the experiment we're going to run. We're going to do a very different transient experiment. And the question is, what is the transient going to look like? Is it going to be smooth? Is it going to show uh, hysteresis? And so then, um, being in a geoscience department, it might always be a good idea to show some real data. So what here is shown is a reconstruction of temperature in central Greenland, derived by um, the Greenland ice core data. This is actually oxygen isotope data conferred, um, converted into temperature. What you see here over the last 25,000 25, years, when we were in the last glacial stage and the Melancholy forcing pushed out higher, 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 uh, the last 10,000 years, the Holocene have been a somewhat of a smooth ride, with a few small exceptions. Uh, but the transition from one state to the other is anything but smooth. What you see here, for example, is uh, something called the Younger Dryas event, where we had a climate threshold response, where we had on the order of 10 degrees C within a few years, maybe years to decades. So this is an example of an abrupt climate change. And we will come back later why this was, because we have actually now very, very good um, findings and hypotheses which are very sound to explain this. So the first question is, gee, what's a threshold? Uh, and this comes back to the discussion of John, other tipping points, what are tipping points, would we see it coming early enough? And I thought it might be helpful to start this very simple. Um, because it, it helps me to, to structure the problem. Um, we talked a lot about feedbacks, and we'll talk more about feedbacks later on. Um, you can think about, in a very simple case, the climate system in a state diagram with a, a climate state and forcing. And if you have a predominant ne strong negative feedback, you have a stable basin of attraction. So the ball would stay here, and you push a little bit, and it comes back to you. And so you push, you release, it comes back, and the system response is driven by how fast you push. Now, if you have a well-behaved system or one dominated by negative feedbacks, you follow the green, the, sorry, the blue dotted line. Um, and things are pretty easy to predict. Now, if the feedback shifts from a predominant negative to a positive feedback, then what you have is this bifurcation where you can either be in this one or here. And the positive feedback is simple. If I take this pointer and I push, there is a negative feedback, negative feedback, negative feedback of friction. But once I push it over here, of course, the system dynamic changes and the thing falls down. Now, there are a few things that happen at the point where you cross this threshold. For one, the forcing is the the response is then determined by the internal system dynamics as opposed to your forcing. And so I, I push very slowly, but the falling down is fast because of gravity and friction. And so a small forcing and a slow forcing can respond in, can result in a large response. A second, if I push this over and I put, it falls down and push back, the, the thing doesn't come back magically. There's hysteresis. And so if you don't like this state, then just going back and forcing doesn't get you back to where you started out, uh, which is quite interesting because the hysteresis then amplifies the marginal damages of the last ton of forcing that pushes you over. And so that brings me to the second point. The abruptness and the hysteresis can amplify the marginal impacts of triggering something. And this effect can be rather large. 
and the hysteresis is clear, you get stuck in a bad system, in a bad state, and so the damage is just accumulated over time. And the abruptness is an amplification because abrupt changes, fast changes, typically impose larger stresses on the system, for example, ecosystem, which can adapt less um, easily. And so you have an issue about an optimum control problem. Now, the, the last point is that, uh, of course, it would sure as hell be nice to know where the threshold is, and we will return to this later on. Okay, so I've given you a an, an cartoon of a threshold. What are examples? And I've, this is, the, the way I think this is structured is that it first helps to think about what determines the threshold in general terms, and then to look at the Earth system and say, where do we have evidence for positive negative feedbacks where we can have this bifurcation? And so this is a summary, it's, it's, an, it's a partial list of thresholds uh, with wherever subjectively chosen uh, that could hit us um, is in response to anthropogenic climate forces. Those are a melting of the green and ice sheet, bleaching of corals, and permanent change in El Nino, or a collapse of the North Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or MRC. There are many more. Uh, this is just an example list. Uh, they have temperature, the estimates of where the temperature is where you start to trigger them are ambiguous to say the least, or guesswork to be a little bit more precise. They range between one and a half degrees to maybe five degrees. So for example, green and ice sheet melting is, some people say one and a half to two degrees. Uh, like the French say, if the temperature is really one and a half to two degrees, les carons sont cuit, the carrots are cooked. Uh, because absent geoengineering, this is rather light, well, it's very hard to stay below 1.5 degree. If you committed warming right now, it's around 1.5 degree, absent any more emissions. Uh, and of course, the consequences are, are interesting. Uh, there are between two and seven meters sea level rise in green and ice sheet, depending on how fast and how much you would do. Uh, there are interactions because you have uh, the freshwater in the Atlantic changes the ocean circulation. Coral bleaching, um, you have food production, tourism, ecosystem changes. El Nino, um, I don't have to tell you what it means to be, have changed in El Nino. If you drive up Route 1 in El Nino, you can't drive because the road is flooded, uh, and other things. Um, so you have flooding, food production, and an MOC collapse uh, would, for example, do precipitation changes, fisheries, terrestrial ecosystems. So let's focus on one of those thresholds and the MOC, and this is not because this is the most urgent one or the most important one. This is just because this is where maybe it's easiest from a didactic point of view to explain it, and we have done the most work. And we would like to draw go to searches where there is uh, light as opposed to where the key is. And so, but what the hell, uh, let's go here because I think it's interesting and the physics is interesting, uh, even though I think here is where most of the action is and where uh, actually many people are moving, including me. So, um, let's think first about feedbacks and think about the physics. So, uh, a picture, a depiction, a cartoon of the Earth, uh, North Atlantic Basin. What we have is a rather interesting interplay of surface currents and deep water currents. In a nutshell, the overturning circulation, the meridional overturning circulation means you have an overturning of surface flow here coming down, and then of course you have to close the loop. What happens is that water flowing up towards the high polar region cools down by heat exchange with the cold air. Uh, water that is very dense, for example, by brine rejection in the winter, uh, then forms deep water. The deep water then flows as the western boundary current, goes to the southern ocean, circles on average two to three times around Antarctica, comes up into Pacific, comes around Africa, comes back, and closes the loop on a time scale of roughly a thousand years. Now this is a gigantic heat transport mechanism. Um, and you can see the effect of the heat transport mechanism, for example, by comparing the climate, and this is a somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek comparison, but let me just put it this one. Uh, compare the climate in Great Britain, where you can have roses, to the um, similar location in, in Canada, where you shouldn't try to, uh, to plant roses because the climate is very different. And you can also see it, for example, by the extent of winter sea ice color, which is vastly receding where you have this warm water system. 
And it makes sense because what you have is you have deep water formation because of cooling of the water, but the cooling of the water means the warming of the air. And so you actually have a gigantic warming effect, heat transport across the equator towards, northern towards the northern hemisphere. Now, why is there a potential collapse? Um, basically, there are two things happening. A, if we warm the climate, we have um, a warming of the surface water, but if you warm water, it becomes less dense, and hence it doesn't want to sink, which is one. And second, if you warm the climate, you have more freshwater precipitation, you have a more active hydrological cycle, and that means it rains more, and of course, more rain into the ocean becomes lighter water, which doesn't want to sink down. Now, why is there an MRC to start with, and why might it collapse in a freshwater response? This is due to this intricate interplay between positive and negative feedbacks. Uh, the negative feedback, which is interesting, is that there is an in feedback between MRC intensity, the low latitude, advection, and sea surface temperature. Uh, and we will not go into this one here, but that is the reason why we have a stable MRC. But this one here is quite interesting, the positive feedback. And this is for maybe an interesting accident of geography or continent allocation. Um, what you have is that it rains a lot in the North Atlantic. Well, we know that uh, if you live in, uh, in, in the UK. So you have a net freshwater input. So water that moves from here to here picks up freshwater. Now, if the MRC is moving along nicely, you move fast through this region of net freshwater input, and then you don't pick up much fresh water. But if you slow it down by some, some way, you slow down the water, you have more time to pick up fresh water, which makes it less dense, which gives less deep water formation, and then the less deep water formation basically plugs up the system because what doesn't go down doesn't get replenished, and you have basically this race to the bottom where you have this bang-bang solution of a collapse. And so there's this positive uh, salt advection feedback which could trigger this bifurcation in the system. And this is a classic result. Uh, Stommel wrote this in 1967, I think, a classic paper showing this, this wonderful bifurcation response. So you might say, gee, so what? Why do I need, why should I think about this for economics? Um, and here's one way how you might want to start think about this, how this threshold response interacts with decision analysis and efficiency analysis. What we show here is a change in utility in the standard DICE model once you stick in a bifurcation threshold response of the MOC. It's a function of abatement um, in you know, 2045, just a sensitivity study, around an optimal path. What you have is this is artificially uh, set to zero uh, at the business as usual. And what you have is interesting, you have two maxima, not one. It's a non-convex system. The first maxima means abate at roughly 15%, which is the standard solution of the DICE model. And you know all why this is, because a little bit of abatement, 15%, is improves utility because you do the cheap abatement and you avoid expensive damages. Duh. So that's fine. Now, in here, you still trigger an MSC collapse. And if the damages are large, well, uh, this might be not very helpful. If you abate more, there is this interesting shadow region where adding, uh, increasing abatement doesn't avoid the threshold collapse. So you invest, 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 but you don't get the payoff of avoiding the threshold. So it actually goes down in the utility. But at some point when you really avoid the threshold, the utility goes up because you actually have the benefit of the avoided damages. And you have the second maximum, which in this case is the global maxima. And then once you go beyond that, of course, um, doing more is, again, not really a good strategy because you um, would basically reduce CO2 emissions, which are very expensive, and you, you have basically avoided a bad impact. So the inter consideration of a fragile response does at least three things. One, it can increase optimal abatement, as shown here, because the optimal situation is here, 50% as opposed to 15% in the standard DICE model. Two, it introduces non-convexity, uh, which is interesting from a numerical point of view, but also interesting from an analytical point of view, because the first order 
a condition for optimality, of course, goes out of the window, which is, makes it interesting, or a pain in the neck, depending on what you do. Um, and it also increases the ambiguity, which is why I, I showed one slide of economics. I had to, sorry. Um, <laughs> why? Well, the ambiguity, I think there's an interesting mapping of where natural and where social science comes in. The natural science uh, is mostly setting this direction where is the forcing threshold? Because if the threshold is early, you have to do more abatement. And so here's the natural science. How big this step here is mostly the social science, well, what are the impacts? And so you have those two axes of, of information flow. Uh, I will focus on here and will comment this afternoon on the other one. Uh, and so the question is how ambiguous are predictions about an MOC threshold response? The answer is very. Um, the, Arguably best estimate I've seen is a really nice paper by Sigfeld, Kirsten Sigfeld et al. in climatic change where they did an expert hesitation. Um, and they ask what's the probability of an AMOC collapse? Uh, the A is for Atlantic because there are other overturn circulations, but it certainly is better than THC because if you Google THC, you get real responses. Um, so here's the AMOC collapse probability. Here's a temperature increase in 2100. The likely range, according to the IPCC uh, fourth assessment report, is from here to here. And because IPCC is very calibrated in what it means, this has a probabilistic interpretation. I think it's a wrong interpretation, but nonetheless. Um, and so if the temperature isn't warming a lot, um, the experts say, ah, it's not a big problem, at least when you call it not a big problem, less than, let's say, 5% probability. But if you have large forcing, which is in the upper tail of the climate sensitivity, then the experts start to disagree widely, which means the ambiguity can be especially large in the tails of the PDF, non-surprising, simple, because in the tail, you have, by definition, few observations, and then the prior is very important, and the priors, of course, differ, and some threshold responses are tail area events, not all, but at least the MOC is in tail area event, which makes it interesting. Okay. We say, hmm, interesting, but what about learning? Um, let me address the learning question in two parts. Part one, learning about climate sensitivity. Part two, the learning about the threshold. Uh, there has been a lot of press recently about A, Marty Weitzman, and B, Rowan Baker about climate sensitivity. And the basic question is, are the fat tails something which is, you know, God-given or an in- inherent uh, property of the Earth system. And Rowan Baker claim, and I quote, the shape of the climate sensitivity probability density function is an inevitable and general consequence of the nature of the climate system. Well, if it's a climate system and inevitable, then, well, we're just stuck with it. We have a fat tail. Um, and that implies to some that we're unable to learn. Now, um, I think this is a wrong interpretation, even what they wrote, or they have a wrong interpretation of the system. Because you can show rather convincingly that if you increase the precision of key observations, you're able to reduce the skewness to make the precision larger, given all the ambiguity and, and deeper uncertainties. Or, but, so what we've shown is that um, if you increase the precision of key observations, then in principle you can reduce the uncertainty reduce the ambiguity and cut off the tail. What we've shown here is that actually it is the ocean heat uptake, not the atmospheric warming, that right now is a key limiting factor. We can talk more about the science. There's a paper I can send to you. Um, why does this matter? Well, it matters for decision making because if it is inevitable, then you should have different strategies as opposed to you can learn about something because then investing into very focused observation systems can tell you a lot. I'm not saying you should do nothing and wait for the data to do something, you know, we're beyond that. But there is an additional issue of uh, a strategy of acquiring information while you adapt, uh, which is interesting. So the value of information about cutting off the tail of the PDF of climate sensitivity, for example, is, I would presume, rather high. Rob. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go. Uh, the, the, the way you've done the learning there, um, the, climate sensitive, the true climate sensitivity is three. 
basically. Yeah. What, what would those look like and if the true client sensitivity was eight? Would it be Excellent question. We're doing this right now. Okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? It seems as if the learning changes it seems as if the learning changes the mean in the picture. Excellent point. Um, what you see here is the marginal projection of a multidimensional PDF. Uh, and if you go to the paper, you see that the joint PDF between ocean depressivity and climate sensitivity isn't changing the mean, but the marginal projection is. So we should talk offline about this. That's an excellent observation, which is uh, counterintuitive and caused me a lot of headache to think about it. It gets easier when you think about two dimensions. I'll send you the paper. Or maybe we fly back on the same flight so we can chat more. <laughs> okay. So that's climate sensitivity. Uh, the second one is, I think, more interesting. It's the, f can you learn about a threshold early enough? And this is where um, I enjoy watching cartoons with my six year or five year old son. Um, different cultures have a very different sense of humor. Uh, and I still have trouble laughing about American jokes. Um, <laughs> as you might have about my jokes. But the point is, um, there's something inherently funny about this one because at a very early age, kids laugh about this. What you see here is, of course, Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. Uh, they're both running, uh, but there is a difference either in the ability to stop or in the ability to look forward. Uh, because what happens is that Wile E. Coyote uh, went over the cliff and doesn't know what's going on. And so if he's a rational being, then there is apparently a rational route to going over the cliff. So the question is, are we more like Roadrunner or like Wally Coyote? And I think for many thresholds, we're more like Wally Coyote. Why is that? So what we've done here is to set up almost a straw man, but a straw man which is even if you, oh, oh please wait. What we did is the following. We thought about the simplest possible way to do a question of early learning. And early learning means you learn early enough before you've triggered the threshold response. What we've done is a simple model of the MOC, the marginal overdone circulation, which has typically 20 swear drops. A swear drop is a million cubic meter per second. So the Amazon is 0.2. This is a lot of water flowing down. And you have three cases, the unforced, the low sensitivity, which doesn't collapse. It weakens but recovers, and the high sensitivity. And this is an extremely simple model. There we consider only one uncertain parameter. In reality, there are many, many more. So this is the simplest, this is much easier to learn about this problem than about the real problem, because we've just one parameter. And there's a little bit of noise in it, and, but we actually know the structure of the noise, which is even, even nicer. And so the question is, um, where's the bifurcation? And because the model is simple, we know it precisely. It's around 143 years, just for, for reference. So here's where you go over the cliff. Um, and now the question is, um, would we be able to keep the blue apart from the green and the red? I apologize for the colorblind in the audience. Can we keep this one apart from that? Yes, we can. And it's very easy, around 50 years, you don't need statistics for that. Is it possible to keep the green from the red? Yes, we can, around here, which is around 200 years or 150 years. But this is after the threshold. <laughs> so that's a problem. Um, and we can talk more about this. Um, the problem why this is important is that currently most assessment of MOC observation systems are done for the detection problem. But, and I published papers on this too until David Bradford, a very wise man, said, Klaus, <sighs> bygones are bygones, detection is about the past. Uh, we are concerned about the future, we need prediction. And I said, oh, okay, uh, prediction is actually hard. I said, yes. So, so the point here is that if you think about the time you need for detection, time for prediction, your intuition of this figure is, is clear. Uh, 70 years here, 100 years there. Um, of course, because detection prediction are result of random variables, because there's noise in it, the detection time, prediction times are random variables. Uh, but uh, you can basically detect after 50 years and you predict after 150 years. Now, it sure as hell would be nice to be able to predict early which means before, and that means that you need something which has a higher signal-to-noise ratio. And um, what we're doing right now is, with NSF funding, we're looking at specific MOC observation systems in terms of improving the signal-to-noise ratio in a very specific way, not to improve detection time, not to improve prediction time, but actually, can you maximize the economic value of information? 
uh, which, because when you sharpen PDF, you can do the value of information. And the hypothesis is that sometimes it might help more to learn about climate sensitivity than about the MOC because there are different feedbacks going in the system. Okay, conclusions. One, the modes of predictions hinge critically on diversion expert assessments. That's my, that's basically, it's ambiguous. You've known that. Secondly, and more to the point, the potential for threshold responses amplifies the ambiguity. And this is because, A, the marginal damages can be highly amplified due to the abruptness and hysteresis. But the marginal damages, uh, which is the magnitude of the amplification, is largely driven by expert assessments. If you try to find a good source for what are the economic damages of an MOC collapse, you basically have a big round hole and a few papers in it which, you know, say, oh, maybe 0 0.5 to give to, basically, it's arm waving. Second, climate thresholds can be low probability events, and the ambiguity in the tails of the PDF, which associated with the low probability, can be especially large. And it is unclear whether the currently deployed observation system would deliver an actual an actionable early warning signal of an approaching threshold response. Uh, and of course, the standard FANGs, uh, I'm just a talking head here. All of the work, almost all the work has been done here by postdocs and students with the usual funding. Uh, the papers I can send you, they're on my web, web page. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to address them. Yeah, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you and, and Yes. Um, Ellen and Hargraves have a bunch of papers taking a very militant line that with the right Bayesian methods, the uncertainty of climate sensitivity is very small, much smaller than all these papers. Um, I sort of had a little bit of a you know, blog type dispute with, with Annan and it seems that he wasn't taking feedbacks outside the model into account, but I, I just thought I'd be interested in comments if you know those papers and have thoughts about them. Should I? Uh, yeah, I didn't catch the whole question. Well, uh, so Maybe I'll, if I'll people could with, speak uh, I, I closer to their mic. Did you catch it? Yes. Okay. So the question was that Enon and Hargraves have a few papers in published and in press, uh, one in climatic change, uh, a few in GRL, and a few unpublished ones, where their climate sensitivity uncertainty is much smaller than what the IPCC is showing or what I'm showing. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of reasons for that, and I think, fortunately, we can trace the reasons for those differences. Number one, um, if you take a strong prior, then, of course, you can cut off the tail. That's obvious. Uh, and I would just suggest you look very carefully what the prior is, uh, because they use a rather informative prior derived from paleo information. Now, um, there has been a wonderful paper by Hegel et al. in Nature about using paleo information to inform this, and a very nice response by Tapi Schneider from Caltech. Uh, why this might not have been the smartest approach. Uh, I let you read this. This is Tapio writes wonderful, nice prose. Um, so the point is one: if you take um, informative priors, you can cut off the tails. Points well taken. However, I don't think you can just take a prior which you think is your paleo constraint and then stick it in. You should do it jointly. Uh, that, of course, is something which is very difficult to do. We are working on this right now. Many people are working on it. It's difficult. Number two. Um, you should be very careful to be clear what you mean with climate sensitivity. Uh, is it a parameter which gives you short timescale responses which you can constrain with the daily cycle? So for example, if I look at the daily cycle or the season cycle, uh, then I can take it uh, and I get a very tight PDF and Rader Knuti did this wonderfully. But the problem is that this isn't really, this is an answer, but I don't think it's a positive relevant answer because what we're looking for are, is the effective climate sensitivity which has, which has feedbacks which aren't triggered on the daily cycle. Yeah. And so those are the two things. I f so to summarize, priors and the number of feedbacks that you trigger in the response. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering to what extent the adoptive active learning could reduce the ambiguities and, you know, to, to be beneficial economically. And by adoptive active learning, I mean a process of uh, Bayesian optation by um, more experimental, you know, uh, simulation observations. Well, <clears throat> 
th this isn't exactly what you, what you meant, but uh, in terms of g gaining experimental information <clears throat> and using it to improve our models, uh, th a very exciting area in ecology is to do warming experiments. I alluded to them in my talk, where you take sizable areas of tundra or um, alpine habitat or forest habitat and actually subject it to a decade or more of artificial climate change. And we're doing this in a couple of sites in the Colorado Rockies. Other people are doing it up in uh, tundra in Sweden and Alaska. And there's some experiments going on in bog habitats in Canada and Minnesota. And these experiments are exciting because they are identifying feedback mechanisms that we never knew existed. So we're learning how ecosystems behave by getting, gaining a preview of the warming effect by manipulating ecosystems. But there's a limit to how far you can do that. And the, the major limit has to do with spatial scale. You can only do experiments like that <clears throat> on scales of you know, roughly the size of a soccer field. You, ca you can't do experimental ecosystem work where you're manipulating climate on really large scales. And there are scale-dependent effects that really matter, and we can't learn about those from these experiments. The second problem is just the time scale that's available. I mean, a typical National Science Foundation grant gives you three or six years to do whatever you're going to do. The, in the color, one of the Colorado experiments, we've been running it 20 years, uh, thanks to NSF, but that's unusual. And we find, for example, that 15 years into an experiment, a very dramatic effect that showed up in the first five years starts to reverse. And it was a transient effect, but we didn't know that. And if we had stopped the experiment in six years, we would have learned the wrong thing. So um, th those are some of the problems with that kind of learning. The other thing we can learn from is, I, I think we can make more use of this than we have, is looking back over the paleo record. And I gave the example of using the Vostok data to at least put some crude bounds on a feedback factor for carbon release. Mm. And the problem here, each of these things has a limitation. And the problem here is that that's about the past and we're, in, we're heading into a future. And the mechanisms that uh, were working in the past may or may not still be working in the future. They can be dependent on the initial conditions, like how much um, carbon is in the soil. There was a different amount of carbon in the soil 20,000 years ago than there is now. So these, er, each of these learning techniques from experiment and observation has limits. Obviously, in the, uh, in the case of the experimentation with the um, area that you mentioned, one policy would be to spread these experimentations in a, uh, in a uh, critical way, namely in very extreme locations, so that we increase the value of information. And the question of timing, which you correctly, um, uh, quite uh, interestingly alluded to, could be mitigated by spreading you know, more of the experimentations, especially in these critical nodes of uh, extreme changes. Yeah, and, and an example of that was the Minnesota bog experiment that started about 15 years ago, uh, because bog lands contain huge amounts of carbon. And so that's a critical habitat where climate change could cause release of huge amounts of greenhouse gas, or possibly capture of more carbon, depending on the nature of the change. Uh, interestingly, uh, in all of the tropics, there is not a single climate warming experiment, partly because the logistics are difficult. You need electricity to do this kind of experimentation. And um, there's now a big push to try to uh, extend. We have a set of about 25 or 30 warming experiments all over the world, except none are in the tropics. So that's a critical habitat. Um, that will probably be the next on the list to study. Two minor questions. The first one is, uh, 
this whole idea of these field experiments you just spoken about, these football pitches, it really kind of just ignores your, the whole thrust of your argument where you're trying to make the case for, for feedbacks. Yeah. And in fact, you're scaling up what you learn from small, small plots, may ignore all the, the big positive feedbacks you're talking about. Do, right. we, do we know something about it, at least qualitatively? Second thing is also related to the point of learning, and that's more the political economy. Uh, it's, my, it's my belief that some disasters have to happen before politicians really act. Wait, I'm and, sorry, and that so, some disasters will have to happen yeah. before politicians really act. Yeah. And, then the, and, then, and then the question I have to you, is there a kind of a, a sequence of thresholds? So maybe you get one disaster, but there's still a lot of other thresholds where we can learn from yeah. it and still mitigate action. And do we have that information and, and for, 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 for the politicians? And once you cross any threshold, the first one, the planet is sufficiently different from what it was this side of the threshold that our assumptions and models may be completely off base. In other words, thinking of a sequence of thresholds somehow you know, and, and applying the same methods to each one as it comes along has this problem that you're dealing with a different planet. And in a planet where MOC is vastly different we don't know. We don't have studies in which we can say our models are well, you know, are validated, or um, we may find difficulties even just in calibration beyond beyond those thresholds. So I I, I share your um, well. I think it sounds like I share your pessimism about um, ever really getting a handle on this, which again is why I think. Um, well, this is intellectually very, very fascinating. We really need to get busy reducing emissions. It's the only thing that we can plan sensibly to do right now. I don't think we can plan on a certain type of climate uh, for f in the next 50 years. Just follow up on it. So when we cross a threshold, on the one hand, we now know something we didn't know before, <laughs> which is we just <laughs> fell a thousand feet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just crossed the threshold. But what you're saying is, on the other hand, uh, we're now more uncertain about the system because we landed on a ledge which we sort of yeah. haven't uh, explored. Um, and so there's sort of both a reduction of uncertainty in yeah. one sense, but it, we may be in a system that has no analog in the paleo record. And once we're beyond. The, you know, analogs to, with paleo, we're really in uncharted territory. Um, I mean, Bill, you might want to tell me I'm wrong or, or add to this or something, but... No, our, our, um, we've, we've built our models to replicate a, you know, a very stable time period of the last 20,000 years. So we're great at simulating a period when the climate wasn't changing very much namely the period since the last glacial maximum. And the models do reasonably well, even at reproducing some of the events during that time period. But they are not equipped at the moment to handle these tipping points. That physics is hard, uh, with the exception of things like the MOC. But some of the other tipping points, the ones that involve interaction with ecosystems, we're just at the, infant, uh, at the yeah. very beginnings of introducing those important feedbacks. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, I would have to agree with you, unfortunately, that these all tend to tip in the way that we, we would hope that they don't tip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> namely, that they, the, the warming does feed the warming. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any of these feedbacks that goes the other way. Yeah. Any important feedback. Yeah. Is there anything or what can be learned from the paleo record from past warm climates that that does, does any of that information help us understand what the other side of one of these thresholds might look like? We, I think the most, okay, you can learn a lot. Um, the most interesting thing from my subjective assessment is you learn what you don't know. There's been an interesting paper about the PTM, the Pearson Eastern Thermal Maximum, which is a rather st strongish uh, pulse of CO2. And there, that was many million years ago. Uh, and then the, there the point is that we don't know right now have a handle of where the carbon is coming from, and that with tropical climate sensitivity in the usual IVC range, you don't get the warming explanation, and they're looking for, for additional feedbacks. Uh, mm -hmm. So we basically, I think the, 
maybe one of the most fruitful ways to look at the pillar record right now is to see what are things out there where your model has real problems because the question of learning, if you want to be quantitative about this, requires a system model that has to relevant feedbacks. But if you don't look at, if you have just unknown unknowns that are on the model, then you have maybe a, a wrong strategy. But we can, we can certainly, for a certain period of the pay record, we can use the analogy uh, like, you know, last thousand years, last 2,000 years. We can do a little bit of the climate sensitivity, but the, the big whooping threshold issues are on a very different planet, and it's very difficult to do. And it mostly points to things we don't know so far, or which are wrong in the models. In the late Cretaceous, it was very warm, and there were dinosaurs in Alaska. Um, models don't talk about that. Um, the, they can do the, and Alaska was more or less where it is today. <laughs> but Different kind of dinosaurs. Uh, 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 when it I'm comes sorry. to biodiversity, the, the estimates of how many species we're going to lose over the next 100 years range from 5 or 10 percent of the extant species to as much as 60, 65 percent. And having studied the way those estimates are done, I don't believe either limit. I think the limits are um, hugely uncertain. And it could be worse, may not be as bad. These are things that are very difficult to predict. And species matter to climate. It's not just that climate matters to species. And so the, um, the analogs, um, in the um, record don't tell us much about extinction because we're in for an abrupt climate warming that occurs at a much faster pace than the paleo warmings, um, by and large. I mean, there's some small temperature effects in places like Greenland that are very fast, but globally, it's going to be much more rapid. And the rapidity of climate change matters as much as the magnitude when it comes to extinction. Um, a lot of the feedbacks, or at least some of them, seem to be integral rather than proportional. It's sort of, a lot of the feedbacks seem to be integral rather than proportional. That is, yeah. it matters a lot how long we're above, the, That's above right. the temperature. So I made a couple of questions from that. One is, is there a good you know, single number analogous to F that we can, you know, something we can base that on, like degree years or something like that, that we can talk about as, in the same way as we, we, we can talk about here's the, here's the sensitivity and reason about that. And the second, I suppose, is that seems to imply that we're going to have to bite the bullet of geoengineering sooner or later. If there's no easy way of, of yeah, that's something that will reverse past warming seems, seems to be on the, on the agenda at some point. Well, two questions. One, is there a single number which like the climate sensitivity? Second, what does this mean about geoengineering? The first one, I would answer no. The second one, you might want to be careful whether you, Teufel uh, in Belzebub, that's a German way, uh, whether the cure might be worse than, than the disease. Hmm. Um, the, the, for example, there have been many discussions about uh, geoengineering as an economically very, very uh, profitable investment. That, of course, hinges critically whether you can sustain it or whether you find things out and you have to go back. You basically get into Faustian bargain that once you start geoengineering with, for example, aerosols, you have to continue it. If you find out that you change this ozone chemistry and you go back if abrupt warming, where the abruptness could actually lead to large economic damages. We have a paper in reviewing climatic change where we show that you might very well fail on cost-benefit tests based on this contingency that you might fail. So you have to be very careful. Um, of course, engineering is a new option, uh, but um, you have to be very careful about this. I think I would really second here that, um, yes, research is needed, but the, the easier way for me to think about this is reduction of CO2 emissions. If I could comment on that point. So fortunately, nature has run some natural analogs of geoengineering. Mount, the Mount Pinatubo eruption is an analog of flooding the stratosphere with aerosols. And when you look at what that did to the climate system, it accentuated droughts rather significantly. So there, you know, there, there are known knock-on consequences of geoengineering. The other problem with some of these solutions, for example, the one of flooding the stratosphere with aerosols, which is one of the simpler ones and cheaper ones to do, and it's being pushed by some people at a nearby university, um, <laughs> is that it, it increases the reactive surface area of the stratosphere by orders of magnitude. And, and that's, in fact, what led to the ozone hole. 
just a few polar stratospheric clouds, little wispy things up in the Arctic, is, w is what generated the ozone hole. You can't generate it from CFCs alone. You need the reactive surface area. Yeah. Flooding the stratosphere with aerosols is a prescription for putting the stratosphere into a very different chemical state. Um, and, you know, yeah. so it's, it's tricky. <laughs>